Section 1, Chapter 3. Know Your Enemy, Know Yourself. Chapter 3, Section 1. Your Enemy, the Faithful and Obedient. The state itself is explained several other times in this book, so there is no need to repeat it here. Rather, I will concentrate on the real problem, those who believe in and act on behalf of the state. It is particularly difficult for an honest, peaceful person to understand and anticipate the acts of those whose minds are absorbed in evil, dominance, and power, or those committed to obey such monsters. Oftentimes, the most difficult task an abolitionist anarchist faces is explaining the deeds of state actors in a way that it is believable to good, honest people. They tend to think that we're not being truthful, or they think we believe some crazy conspiracy theory, or they think we're confused or delusional. Knowing the facts and having specific references available helps in explaining evil acts to good people. As explained elsewhere in this book, most of the time a good person simply cannot believe how evil state actors can be until they experience it firsthand, and even then many will remain in denial, believing that there must be some simple mistake that caused the tragic events they're experiencing. It would be impossible for me to provide an exhaustive list and vivid description of the evil that has taken place in the last generation or two. Incredible evil has happened simply because people were obedient to the orders of their state masters. Also, there are thousands of other voices shouting this information from every direction. So again, there is no need to list them all here. All a person has to do is look for themselves as the stories are unending. So with that in mind, I would like to tell some stories that are less spoken of, but are examples that we can look at and learn of the nature of those whose minds are so warped by their faith in the state that they would do that which is unthinkable and then believe it to be justified. Chapter 3, Section 1.1 Murder Without a Trace An Alternative Use for the Active Denial System A Millimeter Wave Source Weapon What you are about to read is not science fiction. Understanding the nature of our enemy is critical to understanding the level of evil to which our enemy is capable. Likewise, understanding the tools our enemy has available allows us to become aware of what our enemy is physically capable of achieving. Chapter 3, Section 1.1.01 What Will They Do? We know without question that individuals acting on behalf of the United States government routinely murder innocent men, women, and children in foreign lands under the guise of the War on Terror. We also know without question that individuals acting on behalf of that same government routinely cage, beat, rob, and murder innocent men, women, and children within the geographic boundaries of the U.S. under the excuse of the War on Drugs or sometimes simply for resisting police. We also know without question that the U.S. government and its local subsidiaries routinely prefer to employ badged and uniformed psychopathic morons, halfwits, and thugs to do the bidding of those holding positions of power. We can surmise that those who hold positions of power within all governments will take extreme measures to maintain their positions of power. This lethal combination of power-hungry politicians, bureaucrats, and other government actors, along with hyper-patriotic soldiers and police of sub-average intelligence, added to the legendary levels of institutional incompetency that government agencies are so well known for, caused the casual observer to recognize government as a constant threat to human life. During the debate over the militarization of local police departments within the U.S., one outstanding argument against supplying military armament to police was based on the nature of people to use the weapons and equipment supplied to them, even when such tools and tactics are not necessary. Thus, we have situations in the U.S. where local police use MRAP or mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles and military assault tactics to deliver such things as warrants or traffic and parking violations. 
The result of providing police with military-grade weapons is that police will look for the opportunity to use and justify the possession of that military equipment. This argument is identical to warnings given years ago when the Transportation Safety Administration, TSA, began to deploy airport security tactics that included inappropriate touching and searching of travelers. It was just a matter of time until inspectors with that authority would abuse such authority on a growing scale. And this is exactly what happened. Taking this argument a step further, during the 1950s through at least the mid-1970s, the CIA ran a number of projects that are well documented to have fallen into the same tendency of abuse. CIA operatives were actively engaged in mind control experiments using powerful drugs, and their victims ranged from important political figures to random people encountered by agents in everyday activities, like lunching at a cafe. This being the documented behavior of CIA operatives, logic dictates that we can expect similar behavior from NSA agents today. Realizing the tendency that Given new toys, children will play new games. We must assume that anyone who garners the attention of the wrong NSA agent could be the victim of any weapon or tactic that such agents would be in possession of at any particular time. One deadly myth that permeates the minds of freedom activists is the idea that only famous people can be singled out as a target of the NSA. No matter that volumes of government security information leaked in recent years directly contradicts this myth, most anarchists and liberty activists seem to accept as dogma the silly notion that they are safe and their friends are safe, simply because some famous activist has done dramatic acts of protest and has never been assaulted by the NSA. An aspect of this myth is the almost universal acceptance that the NSA uses some kind of ranking order to decide what liberty celebrity is to be scrutinized. Then, when someone publicly states that they are being watched or bothered by authorities, some liberty celebrity who feels they rank higher will dismiss the lesser libertarian's claim. How ridiculous. Would anyone believe speeding tickets or random acts of violence by police are done by some ranking order? This incredibly dangerous state of denial is a combination of ignorance of the nature of authoritarians and a deep-seated fear of facing the facts when it comes to exactly how our evil our enemy is. In saying this, I'm not trying to use fear as a motivating factor. I'm trying to educate good people who simply can't seem to get their head around the fact that we are dealing with authoritarians who will single out anyone who comes into the crosshair of their scope. They don't care what celebrity ranking you feel they, you deserve, because the agent who is likely to single you out hasn't spent countless hours figuring out a who's who of the people you think are important. I like to think of dealing with the NSA as very much the same as hiking in a swamp. I write this from a campground in the deep southeastern United States, where there are wide swamps filled with all kinds of dangerous creatures. Within a five-minute walk of my camp, I could encounter a bobcat, a coyote, a rattlesnake, a cottonmouth viper, fire ants, or a hungry alligator. None of these creatures would treat me kindly. Yet I hike every day in these swamps because I love them. I do not need to be afraid, but the reason I don't fear is because I am aware of the danger, and I know how to protect myself in any situation." Therefore, I am motivated by knowledge, not fear. Blindly believing the NSA won't target you because you aren't famous is like walking through a swamp without being aware of the dangers. An alligator, like an NSA agent, should be treated as a simple-minded predator who will strike anything within its reach, and the facts support this comparison. Chapter 3, Section 1.1.02 What Can They Do? The Range R is a handheld device that can be used to see through walls, including reinforced concrete. It has a 50-foot range and sells for about $6,000 as of the date of this writing. From a legal case being heard in Denver, Colorado at the time of this writing, we know that at least 50 local police agencies possess and use the Range R device. 
It can be used to see through floors, doors, and walls, and can detect human movement. It can see the heat of a live human body and can distinguish between a human body and other heat-producing items in a room. So, for example, the Range R can be used in a hotel or apartment to monitor the position and movement of a specific subject in a room directly above, below, or beside the room containing the authoritarian. In addition to the Range R, for at least the last three years, the New York Police Department has had two or more unmarked vans equipped with surveillance devices that allow the NYPD to see through cars and buildings from the street. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection also uses vans of this type as well as other agencies of the Department of Homeland Security. It is known that they have been deployed at the Republican National Convention and the Super Bowl. These vans are produced by American Science and Engineering Incorporated, and it can be reasonably assumed that other police agencies across the U.S. and around the world have these vans as well. We also know from widely available sources, including the U.S. government, that military drones can see through roofs and walls from ranges as high as 30,000 feet and can distinguish between adults, children, and pets and can determine with certainty when a strike victim dies by monitoring his body temperature. Together, these facts lead us to understand that a person or persons can be remotely monitored for movement and body temperature on a street or inside a home, apartment, or hotel room, anywhere in the world by an authoritarian agent. In 1975, 41 years ago, during the Senate's church committee hearing on illegal intelligence gathering by the U.S. government, it was admitted that the CIA used a drug to induce heart attacks as a form of assassination. These senators on the church committee actually passed around a gun that fired a dart used to deliver a drug that caused a heart attack. Photographs have been widely circulated showing Senators Frank Church, John Tower, and Barry Goldwater holding and examining such a dart gun. It has since been alleged that the CIA, in conjunction with the U.S. Army, have isolated and weaponized viruses that are more dependable and harder to trace than the drugs they previously used. Again, alleged, not proven. But whistleblowers have come forward and admitted their involvement in the development of such viruses. Since the CIA admitted 41 years ago that they had a drug that could accomplish this task, I think it's reasonable to assume they have improved their methods. Therefore, I can say with reasonable confidence that individuals acting on behalf of the U.S. government can and have used heart failure as a weapon, and logic dictates that their methods, tools, and technologies have been refined and improved since 1975. The active denial system is a millimeter wave source weapon, microwave, that heats the water in a human target's skin and thus causes incapacitating pain. Its stated purpose is for riot control duty with a wide beam of energy intended to influence a crowd into moving back or dispersing. Developed primarily by Raytheon, these devices are intended to cause severe pain while leaving no lasting damage and can be deployed through obstacles such as non-metal walls. However, the device has not seen widespread use as of the date of this writing. The following information in quotes comes from the document Bioeffects of Selected Non-Lethal Weapons, Addendum to the Non-Lethal Technologies Worldwide Study, NGIC-1147-101-2, by the Department of the Army, 1998. The topic is the existence of a weapon, the active denial system named above, used for warming the skin to an uncomfortable level for crowd control purposes. The range of the weapon is stated as hundreds of meters, but the paper suggests it can be used at close range with man-portable equipment. Mechanism to produce the desired effects. This concept builds on about 40 years of experience with the heating effects of microwaves. 
numerous studies have been performed on animals to identify characteristics of importance to the understanding of energy deposition in animals. As a result of the physics, the relationship between the size of the animal and the wavelength of the radio frequency energy is most important. In fact, the human exposure guidelines to radio frequency radiation are designed around knowledge of the differential absorption as a function of frequency and body size. The challenge is to minimize the time to effect while causing no permanent injury to any organ or the total body and to optimize the equipment function. The orientation of the incident energy with respect to the orientation of the animal is also important. At this point, the topic shifts to the heating of specific internal organs rather than simply heating the skin, and doing so not for crowd control, but for some innovative use on an individual. The paper goes on. Because of the apparently safe nature of body heating using microwave techniques, a variety of innovative uses of EM energy for human applications are being explored. The non-lethal application would embody a highly sophisticated microwave assembly that can be used to project microwaves in order to provide a controlled heating of a person. This controlled heating will raise the core temperature of the individual to a predetermined level to mimic a high fever. While not inflicting deadly force, the concept of heating is straightforward. The challenge is to identify and produce the correct mix of frequencies and power levels needed to do the remote heating while not injuring the specific organs in the individual illuminated by the beam. The paper goes into the details of power settings and duration of exposure for specific results and states that vital signs can be monitored remotely to fine-tune the exposure. It states that prolonged exposure causing temperatures above 107 degrees Fahrenheit would be lethal. It also says that this process can be used to upset the water balance of a subject being irradiated. The paper doesn't explain what it means by water balance, but when I described this to a cardiologist, he knew exactly what I was talking about. Keep reading. Because the body is inhomogeneous, certain organs are, by virtue of their size and geometry, more easily coupled with one radio frequency wavelength than another. In other words, the beam can be tuned to affect one organ while not affecting others. Additionally, the document infers that the microwave beams can penetrate walls. However, the document states that metal or metal screens would block the beam. Chapter 3, Section 1.1.03. What does all of this mean? As stated above, devices are known to exist that can monitor your movements in your house. They can observe your heart rate and your body temperature. Once you are in a verified location where it is determined you will remain for an extended period of time, a bed or a chair, a microwave beam can be used to mimic a fever in a specific organ of your body like your liver. You would not feel this beam nor its effects. This will cause your body to react to this fever as if an actual infection has set in. Your body's immune system would respond by retaining salt and water for the fight against this perceived infection. As soon as you move out of the beam's strike zone or as soon as the beam is turned off, the organ would return to normal temperature with no long-term damage to that organ. However, Repeated exposures, perhaps only three to five sessions, would cause a person's immune system to retain water and salt on a large scale, causing swelling and sudden weight gain. However, repeated exposures, perhaps only three to five sessions, would cause a person's immune system to retain water and salt on a large scale, causing swelling and sudden weight gain in the torso of the victim. Once this process is started, it causes runaway swelling of the fat tissue in the torso, including the tissue surrounding the heart. This would result in congestive heart failure, which is exactly what the cardiologist described to me when I asked him about water balance and a localized fever in the liver. In other words, congestive heart failure could be inflicted upon an otherwise healthy victim. The result of repeated exposure to a focused microwave beam used to mimic a fever slash infection in any of several internal organs. The heart, though initially undamaged, 
would be squeezed by the fluid buildup in the chest cavity and would not be able to perform properly, causing the well-known runaway effects of water slash salt retention. The early symptoms would mimic chest congestion or possibly an asthma attack, and the unaware victim would likely think they had a chest cold or pneumonia until the time that the heart could no longer function correctly. Then, if untreated, the heart would fail, causing death. Treatment to reverse the effects of this microwave beam prior to death would be as simple as administering diuretics to facilitate fluid removal through urination. The time frame involved from initial exposure to the weapon to death would be dictated by the health and body weight of the victim. That may be a matter of hours or days, up to several months. Using the methods outlined here, a healthy person could be remotely murdered by elements of a government without ever exposing the government agent or agents to the dangers or complications of actual contact with the victim. The death would appear to be of natural causes and would be completely untraceable, as no chemical or physical residue would remain on or in the body of the victim. The murder could be accomplished from an adjacent apartment, hotel room, rented house, or mobile van. This brings up the question, who could be a victim of such an operation? It's important to remember in considering this question what we have already established as to the nature of the government agents who would be in possession of such a weapon. We know from the documented behavior of CIA agents in using psychoactive drugs that randomly chosen people were targeted along with at least one case in Paris, France, where a CIA agent targeted an art student due to an argument in a sidewalk cafe. More on this below. This coupled with the knowledge that given spiffy new toys, the authoritarian has a tendency to look for opportunities to use said toys, and you have the potential of government agents killing almost anyone for almost any reason or perhaps no reason other than the fact that they can do it and get away with it. As difficult as this concept is for a sane, peaceful person to accept, the fact is that we are not talking about the behavior of sane, peaceful people. Chapter 3, Section 1.1.04, Stanley Glickman Stanley Glickman was a promising young painter studying art in Paris. He was not politically involved in any way and was not an activist of any kind. He was an art student in love, planning a future. Glickman encountered some well-dressed Americans in a cafe in Paris. After a discussion that resulted in a disagreement, Glickman agreed to a round of drinks as a peace offering. The man who purchased the round of drinks and served Glickman's drink to him turned out to be the notorious MK Ultra operative. Sidney Gottlieb. Likely due to drugs placed in his drink, Glickman suffered intense hallucinations that resulted in his being admitted to the psychiatric ward of a hospital where he was further subjected to more hallucinogens and electroshock treatments by CIA operatives. Stanley Glickman never recovered from the experiments and was dependent on his family to take care of him until his eventual death. Stanley Glickman's crime Sidney Gottlieb wanted a guinea pig and Stanley Glickman was in the wrong cafe at the wrong time. Why am I talking about a victim of MKUltra and the CIA's experiments when the topic was a heart attack gun? Because Stanley Glickman was tortured and murdered to satisfy the curiosity and ego of an operative of the state. And others assisted in this dreadful crime simply because they were told to do so. Stanley Glickman was tortured because people were obedient and did their jobs. This is the nature of the people who now possess weapons that can both see through walls and kill you without leaving any trace of how it was accomplished. Stanley Glickman's engagement in a conversation and his opinion ran contrary to that of a CIA agent. The CIA agent possessed a weapon and used it on Stanley Glickman for the exact same reason a SWAT team uses a MRAP to serve a court summons for a parking violation, because children will play new games when given new toys. Demented children play demented games. Given the small set of examples listed here, and understanding that I could continue listing examples for thousands of pages 
one must come to the conclusion that we are not struggling against people who are simply confused about freedom and rights. We are fighting evil in its pure form. We cannot play nice. We cannot expect to reason with these demented servants of the state any more than we can reason with those to whom governments of the world owe some $57 trillion, CIA World Factbook, our logic will not reach them. Our pleas mean nothing to them. Joining them and trying to use them to do our bidding will only make us like them. It is only once you view the reality of police and government servants as being an occupation army serving their political masters that their savagery begins to make sense. Once you begin to view the political establishment as nothing but puppets serving the international money masters, the whole beast begins to make sense. The hard fact is that we have but one and only one choice. Bring this beast and its enforcers down before they turn this planet into a radioactive ash heap. Humanity is at war, but sadly few humans realize the battlefield, the armies, or the stakes. Chapter 3, Section 1.2 The True Nature of Evil The most dangerous enemy is the one who can convince you he doesn't exist. To this end, key members of the intelligentsia have gone to great lengths to convince educated people that there is no such thing as evil. It's an interesting philosophical exercise that can allow a thinking person to contemplate deep concepts from a morally neutral point of view and can lead to some enlightening thoughts. But it all falls apart when you find out that while you are sipping your boutique coffee, chatting with your brilliant and beautiful friends at the university, your wife was stopped on the street for a minor traffic violation. But then the cop beat her to death while she resisted and the cop feared for his life. All the while, your children were sitting in your automobile watching their mother die. In other words, the intelligentsia has deceived you and your philosophy stinks. The world contains evil humans who do evil deeds, and the vast majority of evil deeds are those done under the guise of authority. Second, only to convincing you that your enemy doesn't exist is convincing you that your enemy looks vastly different than he actually looks. This is a simple task and is much easier to sell to a wider audience than just the self-appointed intellectual elite in their university halls. The mainstream clergy make an incredibly comfortable living demonizing a wide array of normal human activities while relying on guilt and ignorance to fill their congregations with the fear of eternal punishment for things that simply can't be called evil by an honest thinking person. So if we believe the state-approved clergy, a drink of whiskey, some mutual fun with your date, using a forbidden word in a sentence, wearing the wrong clothing, listening to the wrong music, keeping the details of your life private and out of the priest's ears, or simply earning money and keeping it for yourself, are all called evil, and you are told they will push you down the highway to hell, now let's all join that same impressive clergyman as he leads us in a Solomon prayer for God to bless the brave troops as they rape, pillage, and burn the innocent in faraway lands. And let's not forget to pray that God guides and protects our great leader and fills him with wisdom as he decides which poor village he will incinerate this week. Perhaps that clergyman misunderstood the scripture that states, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Before someone claims that I'm Christian bashing for calling out the corruption of clergy, let me point out some others who are guilty of using the same method of bait and switch in the definition of evil. Almost every television cop show and almost every Hollywood movie drama portrays a cartoon version of evil that is either grossly wrong or intentionally deceptive. We see time and time again lies spoon-fed to the masses that portray cartoon evil villains threatening the innocent, held at bay only by the brave men and women of law enforcement. And evil villains in dark, dirty, foreign countries threatening a peaceful world 
while the only thing that keeps them from enslaving humanity are the good super spies with amazing abilities, fighting for freedom, justice, and the American way. Or the brave American super snipers who never kill the innocent. This storyline is simply a rehashing of the great man slash boogeyman myth, dressed up in a fancy wrapper and sold to yet another generation. If Joseph Goebbels could see modern media, he would be both proud and pleased. To understand evil, you have to dissect authoritarians into three codependent and equally guilty groups. First, the powerful, then the powerful enthralled, and finally, the obedient. First, let's look at the powerful. They are the easy ones to pick on. They are the top tier leaders, the elite central bankers, the upper crust of the corporate world, the highest ranking intelligence officers, the highest ranking military officers, and finally, the least powerful of the top tier, the political heads of state. These are the untouchables. With a few exceptions, these are positions that are handed down to the select, not earned by the deserving. These truly powerful people will do anything to anyone, including each other, to remain in power. They form and break alliances, and as they do, people in the lower ranks die, sometimes in quite large numbers. The one starkly striking thing about these elites is that they, for the most part, apparently believe the entire great man myth and view themselves as a kind of super race destined to guide humanity. Like something out of Mein Kampf or some 1920s eugenics handbook, most of them believe in the hereditary right of ascension, and they practice it. That fact may be hard to believe, especially for Americans who have little or no respect for kings and royal families. But no matter what you or I think, the important thing is that they believe and practice hereditary right of ascension with violent vigor and enthusiasm and in doing so they justify any and all actions that they must take to maintain their power. They believe it is their responsibility, their destiny, and their divinely appointed burden to be in power, and they will incinerate millions without hesitation to fulfill that divine appointment. Individually, they are not Hollywood movie monsters. They are kind to their pets, and they love their mothers, they enjoy art and music and don't ever want to see another ugly war. They give incredible amounts of their wealth to charities, and yet so long as they breathe, they will maintain their power structure, if it means burning their own houses to the ground. This is Acton's axiom. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, displayed in its fullness. Next, let us consider the power enthralled and the other side of Acton's axiom. Bupert's Corollary, Power Attracts the Corruptible Those who want to dominate and are drawn to power are almost always enthralled with those who have power. These are typically the fiercely loyal fanatics, not to a cause, nation, or team, but their loyalty is to powerful individuals, and ultimately their loyalty is to their quest for their own power. On the outer surface, these people tend to appear more obviously evil, as their names are often associated with the kinds of crimes of the state that make the headlines and lead the news cycles. But like almost all criminals, they rarely consider themselves or their actions as evil. They have layers of mental hoops they jump through to justify their actions. They use collectivist excuses to justify killing the innocent or destroying economies, and they almost always believe what they are doing is for the greater good. And as a final level of faith in the state, they believe the double-edged excuse. If the overall action really is bad, their boss is to blame. But if the execution of the action is the part that is bad, their underlings should have refused the order. By writing in the magic middle, they justify their evil by blaming the decision on those above them while blaming the action on those below them. These disgusting humans are incredibly dangerous. Finally, we come to the obedient, the patriotic, the ones bursting with natural or cultural pride, or painted over in civic duty and esprit de corps. Although all categories of humans tend to have overlapping groups, and it's almost never accurate to draw hard lines between people, you should strive to differentiate between the obedient, as described here, and the neutrals, described later in this manual. Neutrals typically are not successful 
and dirty jobs like killing, caging, destroying, extorting, and intimidating because their own set of morals cause them to object to such behavior. In cases where neutrals are forced to commit atrocities due to circumstances, they usually suffer mentally and emotionally, as they lack the coping mechanisms that the more obedient utilize. And that may be the easiest way to judge between neutrals and the obedient, as the more obedient seem to be well-suited taking orders and committing atrocities. Some even relish in the deed, but even then, they find ways of excusing their actions. However, once again, these are not cartoon monsters. They have families. They walk their dog. They get stuck in traffic. They have more debt than they want. They are very often church supporters. They may think cat videos are cute, but given the order, they will kick in your door, kill your dog, and place a gun to your grandmother's head. Then, when they have justified what they have done in their duty report, they will congratulate themselves for being a hero and go home to their children. These very human, seemingly normal, everyday people are our enemies. The powerful will incinerate cities to maintain their power. Those enthralled with the powerful will justify that decision and pass the order to the obedient, who will not only obey, but they will gleefully commit mass murder and brag about it in their old age. The most immediately dangerous individuals of the three groups are the obedient, but you can't win by fighting them because there is an endless supply of the obedient. You have to fight smart and not based on the emotions of the moment. Remember, Henry Kissinger referred to the obedient as dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns. Hidarnas referred to the obedient as the immortals, because as soon as one died, there was another fool waiting to step in and take his place. So again, as much as it seems that the obedient should be our targets, and as much justified hate will be rightly aimed at the obedient in the coming years, we have to look beyond wasting resources and time attempting to engage the obedient directly and find ways to touch the power enthralled and eventually the untouchables. By doing so, we break the chain of command, freeing the obedient so that they may choose to stop obeying. Chapter 3, Section 2 Know Yourself The wise man lives by principles and is never in a hurry to make a bad decision. The fool only knows his immediate desire and rushes towards his next mistake. Oftentimes, the desire to do something overrides the ability to use wisdom in discriminating between what can be done and what should be done, as opposed to what should never be done. Generally, things like anger, fear, desperation, and ignorance are amplified by would-be leaders who have something directly to gain by your foolish choices. One way to spot such a would-be leader is to ask yourself what they have to gain if you follow their lead. What is the real product they're selling? Are they selling a path, a concept, an idea, or are they selling themselves as the guru of that path, concept, idea? Are they teaching their followers how to lead themselves, stand on their own, and go out there and do the right things? Or are they building a dependent following to constantly fluff the leader's ego while he siphons the wealth of the followers? It really doesn't do any good to commit yourself to oppose the state only to sell yourself into the emotional or financial servitude of some guru, liberty cheerleader, or other would-be great man. Rather, examine yourself and ask yourself why you feel the need to follow. Be brutally honest and keep in mind that back in the day, the followers of Jim Jones made every possible excuse to continue believing. It's still that way with the adherence of L. Ron Hubbard, and he's been dead for 30 years. But just because your favorite liberty hero isn't the one calling for believers to follow him into the desert to form a libertarian commune where everyone lives in shipping containers howling with the coyotes at night, that doesn't mean you need to sit on the edge of your seat waiting for your hero's next podcast or video. So again, be honest with yourself. Are you being led towards independence, self-reliance, and wise decision-making, or are you just being led? Self-examination is one important key to learning wisdom. Asking yourself about your motives and your desires and honestly comparing them to tested principles like non-aggression and self-defense is critical in self-development. Thinking in terms of the long approach, rather than focusing on the short-term wants, 
is an exercise in self-control and self-discipline, both critical in the development of wisdom. Teaching yourself to look beyond a sales pitch is an even more advanced key to wisdom that will never stop paying for itself. And finally, the constant reevaluation of your plans, your actions, and your direction is the only way to stay on target to get to your goal. This is true for the individual, and it's true for a group of like-minded individuals seeking a common goal. Otherwise, the naturally more flamboyant personalities will inadvertently become the flawed leaders, and the cause will be lost for yet another generation.